thank you for coming today for the Sunday program here. And we'll be discussing the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, second half. We'll be having a three-part series on the Bhagavad Gita at live. In the previous two parts, we discussed the first chapter, the second chapter, first half. So, can we go to the second chapter, 38 words onwards. So, till now, in the second chapter, Krishna has spoken the knowledge of the soul from 2.11 to 30 to explain how Arjuna should not lament the death of his loved ones because death is inevitable in this world. And yes, even if Arjuna doesn't uh, kill them, the body is perishable and the soul is imperishable. So what is he actually lamenting for? Then from the spiritual perspective, Krishna talks about how if he wins, he will gain the earth. If he loses, he, he will get the heavens. On the other hand, if he doesn't fight, then he will get infamy in this world and he will uh, actually, he, he, that impiety will lead him to wrong, uh, to a distressful destination in the next world. Now, one of the features of the Bhagavad Gita is that it doesn't approach subjects only from one level. It approaches the same subject from different levels. Just like say, if we are studying mathematics, the subject might be the same in level 1 and might be the same in level 10, but the content is different. So similarly, the Bhagavad Gita is speaking about living in a way that will create an auspicious future for ourselves. But the way to create the future, that it talks differently. See, does anyone remember what is the driving question of the Bhagavad Gita? The Bhagavad Gita is an answer to a question of Arjuna. What is that question? Yes, what is dharma? It is not should I fight or should I not fight. He is not asking simply a specific historical, specific contextual question. He takes it to a broader level. What is dharma? So now, dharma means that action which keeps us or brings us in harmony with the nature of things, with the nature of reality. That action which brings us in harmony with the nature of reality. So if we as human beings eat glass, if we eat glass, it's going to kill us. That's out of harmony with the kind of body that we have. So if we try to breathe in carbon dioxide, Okay, we will die. So the body, there is a, there is a particular way the body has to be uh, fed and aerated by which it will function normally. But similarly, there is a particular way in which we need to live by which we can create an auspicious future for ourselves. And Dharma, when it is said that there is a well known verse from the Mahabharata, it also comes in the Gita Desha, it says, that dharma hi desha madhiko vishesho dharma nahi na pashve samana that dharma is what differentiates between humans and animals and without dharma animals are humans are just like animals so what do we really mean here by dharma dharma does it just simply mean oh an animal cannot come and do aarti to the dog or to eat in the temple that's not exactly what dharma is. See, all of us have certain instincts by which we are governed. Animals also have their own kind of intelligence. If a lion wants to catch a deer, and for, for humans, eyes are always quite active. For animals, they operate a lot on smell. So if the lion wants to catch a, uh, catch a say a deer, it knows the wind is flowing this way and the lion will go all around and come from the other side. So it has that intelligence. We may not even sense that, but nah, it does. But all its intelligence is simply like a programmed instinct for the four purposes of Ahar, Nidra, Bhai and Mantra. For 
eating, sleeping, reproducing, and defending. So, animals cannot think of anything beyond these bodily drives. Even if they have intelligence that is directed only towards these bodily drives. But we humans have a capacity to think about the bigger future. Okay, so, um, that means if I do this right now, I will get that in the future. So giving up something in the present so that we can get something much better in the future. That requires a far-sighted vision. So dharma refers basically to look at the long-term nature of things, the long-term consequences of actions, and then act accordingly. So if we understand that death is going to occur, but I will continue, but is there something beyond death? Can I prepare for what happens beyond death? That capacity only human beings have. And not only that, we can also think in the long term in this life beyond just bodily necessities. Okay. We human beings have systematic education for our children. And what is the idea? That in the future, they can have a bright career. Animals also learn. But it is primarily instincts, instinct driven. So, when Krishna is, when the question about dharma, as far as it was simply fighting is concerned, Arjuna said, here is the kingdom, as we are stronger than the Kauravas, we will grab the kingdom. He was thinking, what is the long term way of acting? What is long term beneficial? So, now, Arjuna has been talked to by Krishna at a particular level. So, 2.37 says, that how, can we just have only the verses? Sanskrit or the transliteration. So this was what we discussed in 2.37. Hatova prapsisi swargam jitva vapuksha se mahim. Hatova prapsisi swargam. That if you die, you will have gain heavens. You win, you will gain the earth. That's what we had talked about earlier. So now he is saying that suddenly Krishna seems to speak something very different. So, what is this beside this 2.38? Sukha dukhe sami krutva lava lava jaya jayo tato yudhaya yudhaswa naivam apam avapsyasi So now he is saying jaya jayo Whether you gain victory or victory, failure doesn't matter, just act. Just till just the previous verse he was talking about victory and loss calculation. Now he is saying, don't bother what it is. Just fight. Naivam pavam See, By that, you will not get any sinful results. So just like if you have a child, and the child is playing a game, maybe say cricket, or say an individual game like table tennis. Now, at one level, every child when they are competing, they want to win. Isn't it? So the child will play to win. But if sometimes when the child trying to play, while playing to win, starts becoming very dominating, starts becoming very pushy, starts uh, like becoming physical with other children, and then the other children say, we don't want to play with you. <laughs> then although the child might win one game, but the child will not be invited to play afterwards. Isn't it? So to some extent, this is what in cricket this is what happened to the Australian team. <laughs> they were famous for sledging. And they were reputed as a very they got the reputation as a very a very disagreeable team. So two of their top players in their dismissed from the were suspended for some time. And then the other players came to the senses. So see idea is at one level playing is for winning. But then at another level when you play we may also tell the children to just play. Playing well is what is important. Whether when you lose, win or lose, that is not important. But because it is not just a matter of one match or one play. The child wants to play repeatedly. And winning one match and then not being allowed to play for the rest of one's child. That is completely counterproductive. So the idea is that we have to see the long term thing. 
somebody dominates and pushes and wins, but is perceived as agreeable and nobody wants to play. Then such children become very lonely afterwards. So there is an aspect of winning in playing, but there is an, also an aspect of socializing. You have to integrate. So playing is also meant for bonding together. So they said there is one level purpose of playing is winning. But another level of play, another level of another purpose of playing is there is bonding, there is sharing, there is socializing, there is learning how to work within a team, there is exercising, there is developing one's skills. Everything can be seen at multiple levels of why we are doing a particular thing. So right now say we are having the, this Bhagavad Gita class. Now, why are we having this class? It could be say because you are interested in the Bhagavad Gita. Or it is because you, know, you, you feel this is a part of, it's a part of a pious life to come to a temple and hear some katha. It is, or it could be that you have some questions about life and you are interested in this Bhagavad Gita tells us something about it. Or it could be that your friend called you and you couldn't say no so you have come here. <laughs> so, there will be many reasons why I might do a particular thing. So, Krishna is explaining at different levels. So, there, there are two words in English. There is contradiction and there is a paradox. Contradiction is, there are two sentences which are opposite to each other. But paradox is where the two sentences seem to be opposite or two, two ideas are seen to be opposite, but there is an underlying meaning which reconciles both of them. So, contradiction could be say, you know, this paper, if a teacher is checking a paper, this is, this paper has, has the most correct answers. And the teacher said, this paper has the least correct answers. And if she says this about the same paper, there will be a contradiction. And the most correct answers are the least correct answers. But if the teacher says, the most correct paper is the least corrected paper. The most correct paper is the least corrected paper. There are no corrections, there are no red, if the, if the answers are correct, there are no red marks over there. No. The most correct paper is the least corrected paper. For at first glance, it doesn't make sense. But when you think deeply, it makes sense. So, <clears throat> so if we are to understand the paradox, we have to look at what is the underlying intent that harmonizes two contradictory points. So what appears as a contradiction becomes a paradox, not a contradiction. If we see what is the underlying unifying theme. So at one level, previously Krishna was telling, see if you win also you will gain, if you lose also you will gain. If you win, you get the earth. If you lose, you will get the heavens. But now he is saying, don't worry about winning or losing. Just do your duty. What is going on? That's why it seems to be like a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction, Krishna is speaking at another level. And what is that level? His first issue, he will talk about his level from 38 till almost 53 and this is the second section of we could say doing nishkam karma or karma yoga so the first level he says if you act like this naivam papam if you act in this way you will not get any karmic reactions no negative karmic reactions generally it is to the extent that we seek gain personal gain to that, we get personal implication. We are personally implicated. Say, if somebody is working for a very wealthy person, and somebody is working for a bank, and is a cashier who counts the cash over there. Now, whatever cash comes in, the cashier counts that. Now, if somehow the bank's owners are involved in some scam, and they are embezzling money. Now, if the cashier is simply counting the cash, they are not taking anything for themselves, apart from their salary, then whether that money is legal or illegal, it is the bosses who will be implicated, the cashier will be implicated. But the cashier starts taking a share from that illegal money, then the cashier also becomes implicated. So Krishna is telling over here, if you work in a mood of beauty, naivam papamavapsisi. 
If you are concerned with personal gain, then you will not be bound. I'll talk about what we mean by personal gain when we come to the 2.47 Karma Nivadi Karaste verse. But here a section is starting where Krishna is talking about acting at another level beyond immediate gain or loss. And the next two verses, Krishna. So remember what is going on now? That Krishna is talking about long term results. So one long term could be next life. Actually, in the broad dharmic tradition, there are four levels of lifespan talked about. There is we live, who live on the earth are called as Martya. Those who live in heaven are called as Amaru. Those who live for one day of Brahma are called Chiranji. And those who live forever are called as Nitya. So, Martya is, we probably live for 100 years or something like that. Hmm? If we are fortunate. <laughs> or, if we are unfortunate. <laughs> so, then there is a, <coughs> there is a Amara. Now, the word Amara is very relative. Amara means immortal. But immortal is not exactly the same as eternal. It's so long from the earthly perspective that appears as if it's eternal. So those who live in the heavens, they are Amar. So heavens is where Indra and other devas live. Above that is Brahma and his life. So his life, those who live for his lifetime are called as Chivan Jeeva. But only those who are outside the material world, in the spiritual world, they are Nitya. So now, Krishna in the sections of 2.31 to 37 talked about going from the Martya level to the Amara level. If you do your duty, you will rise to that level. But now, from 2.30 downwards, Krishna is talking not about the Amara level of heavens, but the Nitya level of the spiritual world. That's the mood in the next two verses. But before that, this is a transition verse, 2.39. Can we go down? Let's recite this. Eshate Abhita Sankhe Buddhi Yoge Tvaimam Shrunu Buddhya Yutto Yaya Partha Karma Pandam Prahasyasi So generally when you write a sentence, uh, it's said in writing that the first part of the sentence and the last part of the sentence are where the reader's attention is the most. Generally when you're reading something, it's a long sentence. And okay, first part, the first part, you have to pay attention to it. And then, okay, the last part, okay, let me read it. So generally in the Bhagavad Gita also, it's a four line verse. Sometimes the stress, the most important part, might come the first part or the last part. Every line is important. But, you see the previous verse, the last line was, Naiva Papam Vapsisi. You will not get any negative karmic reactions. But in this verse it is, Karma Bandham Prahasyasi. You will become free from the bondage of karma. It might seem the same, but not exactly the same. Because the bondage of karma can come from papa, it can come also from punya. We can be bound by our bad karma, but we can be bound by our good karma also. Our good karma will take us to heavens, but heavens are also temporary. Good karma will give us good material results, but still we will have a material body. And material body means we are still in the temporary material world. So here Krishna is talking about one level higher. That not just being free from negative karma, but being free from all bondage of karma. And what is saying? That what knowledge I gave you, Abhita Sankhe, the knowledge of the analysis of body and soul which I told you earlier, that now I'll talk to you about how you can apply it. Buddhir Yogi to Imamshunu. How to apply it with your intelligence to connect with transcendence. And if you act in the Subhudhya Yukto Yayapartha, Karma Bandhan Prahasisi, you become free from bondage. Now normally, <coughs> if we consider, say, if there's you have, somebody has a particular disease, say there's a TB, somebody has got, and then there's a standard treatment for that disease. But there's a new treatment that is developed. Now the standard treatment everyone knows, and the patient also expects the standard treatment. But if the doctor wants to do the new treatment, the doctor will have to tell them what is the speciality of the new treatment. And how is it better than the old treatment? So the Bhagavad Gita in one level, at one level is taking Arjun. At that time, most people's idea of life's trajectory was Dharma, Artha, 
काम एंड मोक्ष सो फ्यू पीपल एक्चुअली गॉट द मोक्ष मोस्ट पीपल गॉट धर्म अर्थ काम एंड फॉर क्षत्रिय इट मेट यू लिव धार्मिकली देन यू गेन वेल्थ एंड देन यू गेट काम यू विल फुलफिल योर डिजायर्स एंड यू कैन डू दिस इन दिस लाइफ और इन अ फ्यूचर लाइफ but here arjuna arjun had to had this had this conflict ethical conflict what is that conflict the kama this it doesn't just mean uh, sensuality kama basically means relationships you know we have we have our family our friends our loved ones and through the through the relationships what joy we get so through wealth we get some we have possessions in the world and we have relations in the world the two my primary things we seek in life we seek possessions and we seek relations and generally we seek possessions so that we can get relations so we want to look very attractive so that we have an attractive partner we want to earn a lot so that uh, that, that attractive look is also possession we want to have a lot of wealth so that we can get an attractive partner so possessions and relations are the two main things we seek in life Now, Arjuna's tragedy, or Arjuna's agony, you could say, was dhar was artha and kama pulled him in two different directions. If he wanted a kingdom, he would have to fight against his relatives. But it was with his relatives that he could get kama, as a generic well-being in terms of relations. So artha and kama were pulling him in two different directions. What do I do? So then he, when he is frustrated like this, Krishna will tell him another trajectory. The other tra- that this there is a trajectory of dharma artha kama moksha is called as the karma kanda. But Krishna will talk about yoga. First he will talk about karma yoga and gradually talk about different yogas, culminating in bhakti yoga. So here in the, this section he is going to talk about karma yoga, but because karma kanda. karma kanda basically means religious piety or you could say pious materialism <laughs> pious materialism is where we go to god but primarily is that god will make our life better in this world it's not a bad level of approaching god but it is a level where we see god not as the end but as the means to an end we see god as Oh, I want this in my life, but I can't get it. So God, if I worship you, you should get good. You God will give it to me. So we don't think God as the desirable being. We see as God as the source of desirable things. So most people are at that level of religion. So once a person went to a temple and he prayed to God, Oh God, I have taken this lottery, and if I get, if I win this lottery, it's a million dollars. I will give you fifty percent. Mm-hmm. It's actually two million dollars. I say I'll give fifty percent. I'll give you a million dollars. And then I was waiting one week later. The result was going to come out. And when the result came. He saw his number was there among the winners. I was jubilant. And he was about to dance. It struck him. Hey, he had won the second prize. He had got not two million dollars, but one million dollars. So he came to the temple and said, "Oh God, you are so clever. You took your share before only." <laughs> <laughs> so, just as in business, when we try to weasel out the maximum from whatever we are doing, so like that, and people are at this level of religious materialism. Their interest is not in God, but in God per se, in what God can give me. So this is a trajectory which most people were at. Arjuna was also more or less functioning at that level of trajectory. At least Arjuna's arguments in the first chapter are at, at this trajectory. So Krishna is elevating him from karma yoga, sorry, karma kanda to karma yoga, where don't just look for immortality, don't look for a heavenly life, look for an eternal life. And that's why. So when a new treatment, I said earlier, if a doctor wants to give a new treatment, the first thing the doctor has to tell you what is the speciality of the treatment, what are the special benefits. So the next two verses, Krishna will speak about the special benefits. 
of this particular treatment. The first thing he says is, can you recite this? Neha Vikramana Shosti Pratyavayo Navidyate Svalpamakyasya Dharmasya Rayate Mahato Vayat So, he is saying that there is no danger of loss in this path, rather this path will protect you from the danger of all loss. That Neha Vikramana Shosti there is no danger of loss on this path. But this path will protect you from the danger of all loss. What does it mean, all loss? That whatever we achieve in life, that will be taken away from us at the time of death. It will be taken us away uh, from, from us at the time of death. But what will stay with us is our karma. But it's not just our karma. Even our karma is temporary. Because if you are in the bad karma, we will get the reactions to that and they will get exhausted. If you have done some good karma, we will get the reaction to that also and that will also be exhausted. That's why I said, if you learn karma, if you learn the philosophy of karma, actually, we will never either be too happy nor too distressed. The scheme will come later, but I mention it now. Because what happens? It's okay, it's okay, be happy. Be equal positive and happy and distressed. Why? Because when we are going through happiness, actually, when we are going through happiness, we are exhausting our good karma. It is because of our past good karma that we are happy. And we are getting a happy situation right now. Now if my past good karma is going to get exhausted, and it is getting exhausted, then should I be happy or not? <laughs> On the other hand, when we are going through trouble, what is happening is, it's our bad karma is getting exhausted. So we may be unhappy right now, but we can be happy that our phase of unha our whatever unhappiness is going to come in our life is getting over. So basically, looking from the karma, karma philosophy perspective, we can learn to just tolerate whatever comes in our life. Yes, bad karma is really exhausted, good karma is really exhausted. So if we look for something, so, so karma also does not, the wealth that we get, it will last only for this lifetime. The karma will last till it gets exhausted. But what will stay with us forever is our chetana. It is our consciousness. The kind of consciousness we have developed, that will always be with us. So, <clears throat> if we develop an attraction toward transcendence, if by practicing bhakti, we develop an attraction toward Krishna, or if you are not toward Krishna, just attraction toward transcendence, what is there in this world beyond, beyond the physical pleasures of this world? If you develop that curiosity, develop that attraction, then that will always be with us. And in the next lifetime, wherever we may be, that attraction will stay with us forever. I just met a devotee in Australia. He said he came to a temple for the first time because somebody gave him a book. And he looked at the book and although he had been born in Australia, he just he looked at the Sanskrit text, and he felt, I just know this. And he had never read it. He couldn't pronounce it, but he was very familiar. And then, normally, to learn Sanskrit takes a lot of effort. Now, he became, within three months, more expert in Sanskrit than what other friends were in three, other people had done in three years of study. So, and he soon became a Sanskrit scholar. And so, there's an irresistible fascination. He said, always had a fascination for some books written in some, uh, some unknown scripts. So basically, these are indications that there is something that is carried on eternally. Uh, Janananda Maharaj is one of our leaders. He has written a book called Animals in Krishna Consciousness. <laughs> so what is this book about? That normally, it is only in the human body that you can practice spiritual life. We can, as I said, dharma can be practiced only in the human body. But dharma can be continued even in the animal body. If somebody is in a human body and they start practicing some, some spirituality, and then, then they go, they, <coughs> then they, that somehow that soul does some mysteries while they go to animal life. They might get an animal body, but they will not get animal consciousness. There was a crocodile in a Kerala Vishnu temple which would eat only rice offered to Lord Vishnu. 
and it would not eat any flesh at all. And people would come to that temple not to see Lord Vishnu but to see the crocodile. <laughs> Not so much to see Vishnu as to see the crocodile. So there are extraordinary animals who, who also can have this attraction to a transcendence. So basically, what will stay with us forever is if we have developed an attraction toward Krishna, attraction toward transcendence, no matter where we go, that attraction will stay. It may not manifest immediately. It's not that uh, even a soul who is very spiritually evolved. When the soul falls out of the mother's womb, it will not be the soul will chanting Hare Krishna. The baby may be crying. But the baby will pick up a spirituality very quickly. So Krishna is saying this attraction will be your eternal asset. But there is no loss of this. And then next verse he says that forgetting this, one has to be fixed. So we will not go over all the verses. So the first characteristic he says is that this is as an eternal result. And the second characteristic he says is that as compared to this, everything else has temporary results. He says, if you, even if you go to heaven, it is like flowery words. Flowers look very attractive for some time, but afterwards they fade. And then they dry and they look not too attractive. Similarly, heavenly pleasures are temporary. And then he says, if you are attached to worldly pleasures, you cannot seek an other worldly goal. Bhoveshwari prasaktana taya aparata chetasam and therefore he says, Krishna says, pursue the eternal. And for pursuing the eternal, can you go to 2.46? He uses an interesting metaphor over here. That Yavan, can you repeat, can you sing this? Yavan Artha Uta Pane Sarvata Samhuto Dake Tavan Sarveshu Vedeshu Brahmanasya Vijanata so it's Udapane. Udapane is a well. Sampluto Udake is a river. So if there is whatever water is there in a river, well, all that and much more is there in a river. Externally speaking, the well, if I'm, if I'm here, the well might be in this direction. And that's where I have normally gone to get, get water. And so it does go here now. So, no, no, no. That's where the water is. No, here. Whatever water you go get there, you'll get that and you'll get much more water. So even if the well and the river are in opposite directions, so Karmakanda is one way of living, where one thinks, okay, this will take me to heaven, this is Punya, this is Papa. It's always conscious of that. But in Karma Yoga, one is simply detached from results, performing one's duty for the sake of doing one's duty. So they may see opposite directions. Krishna is saying by doing Karma Yoga, whatever you will get by Karmakanda, you'll get that and much more. Just as a river contains all the water from a well and more. So he's telling that there is a greater result in this. Then now, earlier he said the result is eternal. Now he's giving another comparison to say that, 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 that they say that the result is eternal. And let's go to the to one of the most quoted and the least understood verses of the Gita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 47. Karmanne vadhikaraste. Mahapaleshu Kadachana, Mahakarma Parahe Durbur, Mahate Sandosva Karmani. So, Ma, here Krishna is saying, there are the last three lines, all of them have Ma. Ma means never or don't. Karmane Vadikaraste. You have a right to do your work. Mahapaleshu Kadachana, but not to the fruit of your work. And ma karma phala heturpur. Do not think of yourself as the cause of the result. And ma te sangostu akarmani. Do not be attached to the, do not do your work either. So I was speaking at Princeton last year and this person said, this Bhagavad Gita is complete, as a person said, uh, Bhagavad Gita is completely impractical. He said, no, we work for gaining some results. A student studies because they want marks. You know, we work in our office because we have to meet some deadline, we have to make some product. So, how can you work without caring for the result? It is the result that, in, that inspires us to work. So, what is the Bhagavad Gita telling over here? So, the point over here is there is a difference between goals and results. 
Goals are what we set before we do a work. Results are what we get after the work is done. So the Bhagavad Gita is not telling us don't set goals. You say, what is the difference? The goal will become a result. Is it the same thing? No, there is a big difference. So when we want to put in our effort, we have to put in our full effort in doing anything. And to put in the full effort, the vision of what I want to achieve. A goal gives us a sense of orientation, a sense of direction, a sense of focus. So goals can enable us to do our karma, do our duty wholeheartedly. But there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between karma and phala. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between karma and phala. Just because we have done a particular activity, does not mean necessarily that we will get the corresponding further. And we see this throughout life, isn't it? That two, two or three students might study equal, they might study together. They study all subjects together, they might be more or less similar IQ levels. But all of them don't get the identical marks. So, in, so we often think that our work is the cause of the result. Yes, it is. But it is not the sole cause of the result. Uh, how many of you have had some experience in your lives when you worked very hard, but the result that you got was very meager as compared to the amount of work you had put in? Yes, almost all of us. <laughs> now, this is very frustrating, isn't it? I worked so hard. Uh, Nobody values it, the result didn't come. Now, conversely, you can also think of times when we, we did work, but the result that we got was far more than the work we had put in. Does anyone have that experience? <laughs> that experience also. As a speaker, sometimes I prepare a lot for a class, and Throughout the class, the audience seems to be just waiting to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, I just come and give a uh, modestly prepared class, and the audience is so appreciative. So there is no one-to-one -one correspondence. Mm -hmm. Actually, this doesn't mean that our work and the result are unrelated. But the work is not the sole cause of the result. So what is happening? It is our present work plus our past work. Past work is our past karma. So our present karma and past karma both combine together to give the phala. And sometimes our present karma might be 99% and the past karma might just be 1%. And sometimes our present karma might be 1% and the past karma might be 99%. So Say, if somebody on a cold night eats 10 ice creams at night <laughs> and then the next morning their throat, um, they're eating ice cream but in the morning they say, ice cream! <laughs> <laughs> so now, if their throat is in pain, is that because of past karma? Yes, the past night's karma. <laughs> <laughs> so here, it's just what they did the previous night produced this result. So now, <clears throat> some people, they have to be very, very regulated in their diet. Just a little imbalance in their diet. So some people have some, some peanut intolerance, they cannot take peanut butter or this or that. Now, they, if, even if the, that, that a small ingredient comes in, they have a lot of problems. So in this case, they have not done anything for it. That small mistake from their part, but they might have a severe health issue. It's like 1% mistake on their part. From 1% they were just careless and went near an ingredient or just a little bit of the ingredient they took. 1% mistake, 1% was the karma from this life, 99% was from the previous life. In the case of uh, some people, some people they just eat a little bit little bit inappropriately and uh, and say their uh, body bloats out, balloons out. Just, some people are disposed towards obesity. Some other people, 
they are predisposed for the past karma towards good health. So they treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. <laughs> And still nothing seems to happen. <laughs> so, Bhima was Brukodara. So, it's a Brukodara. Actually, it means he's a, he's a voracious eater. But literally, Brukodara, what it means is, he had a, he had a extraordinary digestive power. So, it's not that he ate a lot and he became obese. No, he ate a lot, but he had phenomenal strength. So the point I'm making is that there is a correlation between, say, what we eat and how our health is. But for some people, if the body is sickly, a small imbalance in eating might lead to a big trouble. For some people, they are overall healthy, even a lot of irregulation in eating, no problem. So there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between action and result. This does not mean that our action is inconsequential. Our actions do matter. But they may not matter simply in terms of the immediate result that we are going to get. If we are doing our karma well, if we are doing our karma refers to action, dharma refers broadly to duty, the right course of action. So if we are doing our karma according to our dharma, our dharma if we are doing our action according to our what is properly expected of us, then, even if the result doesn't come right now, still, that is getting added to our pious credits. That is added to our pious credits. It's not lost. It's not wasted. So, when Krishna is telling over here, Ma Faleshu Kadajana, don't be attached to the results of the work. To make sense of this, what we have to see is, the next line, don't think of yourself as the cause of the result. Ma karma phala So my action is here, the result is here. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. There is a connection, but it is not just this karma. So by doing our karma well, we are either getting the result now or we are creating future stockpile of good karma. So in that sense, we should do our karma. That's the last line. Ma te sangostva karmani. Do not be attached to not doing your work. Mate sangostva karmai. So do your work. But the idea is, this is actually a very empowering way of acting. Because when we work in the world, if we are too result-centered, if the result doesn't come, we'll become completely disheartened and give up working. But if you understand that what is in my hands is my effort, and let me do my effort the, as well as I can. So we set goals so that it inspires us to do our effort as well as possible. And the results don't come. Then we understand that some past karma was involved. But the work I did, it does count. It will contribute to a future good for me. So this, is a, this verse can actually empower us to live peacefully and productively in the world. Productively means we are doing the best that we can, but peaceful means even if the best doesn't come to other times, we can be at peace with ourselves. So this is possible only when we have the big picture. So Krishna is telling to Arjuna that don't, in the context of the war, what does it mean over here? Do not think that you are causing the death of the Kauravas. Do not be attached to the result of their not dying. This will be elaborated later in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says that by their past karma, they are already killed. By my arrangement. What is that arrangement? That arrangement is of the karma. They had done grievously wrong karma, especially they had remained silent when Draupadi was being dishonored. And they had been punished for that. So Krishna is saying, don't think that you are the cause of the result. You do your duty, and what result comes, that is by a higher arrangement. And in that way, be, you can work peacefully. Mate sambhosto karma. Don't think that if you don't do your karma, don't think that if you don't fight, this will not happen. That they will not die. They are destined by their karma to die, so they will die. So this is a key words for understanding how we can work in a way that we don't get too disheartened when results don't come. 
or we don't get too elated when results come. Because if we get very elated when results come, one day we get the results and then after that, the next time when we do, we don't get any results. We wonder what is happening. The nature of the world is somebody is very successful, they are raised up to the sky. And say, suppose the cricket team wins the championship. Big people, thousands and millions are there to welcome and cheer and garland. And then next time they lose a championship, they get a garland of chuckles. <laughs> so their effigies are burned. So the world is characterized by huge dualities. So don't get tossed up and down by these dualities. Because what is in your hands is your work. Any questions or comments about this till now? You can speak, I'll repeat. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you for the nice lecture. Prabhi. I have uh, one question. From practicality, we see the most of the modern world and uh, corporates, uh, the way the entire industry is structured is result oriented. How can we make a small change in the attitude of our own management? So they are looking more at the work aspect of it, not the result aspect. Okay. Most of the management, leadership, and corporate world is focused on result. So how can we help to make it work-centered rather than result-centered? In the practical world, the results are important. And even when Arjuna was fighting the war, they were fighting, they wanted to win the war. As I said, the goal is clear. What is important is, what do you do if the results don't come? It's not that. Karmanne Vadikars Mahaparishwajan doesn't mean we don't care for the results. It doesn't even mean that we don't seek the results. It just it means that we don't become so attached to the results that it distracts us and it consumes us if they don't come upon us. And even in, even in corporate world, that's what is called as resilience. Yes, if you don't get results, that's bad. If you have a failure, that's bad. But then what is appreciated is you will bounce back. Now, how are you going to bounce back? If we wed our sense of self-identity and self-worth to a particular project, to a particular success, and it doesn't come, then we start thinking, I am worthless. So failure is an event in our life. Failure is not the... Fail, mm, a Failures are events. Failures are not people. Nobody is a failure. A person may have a series of failures in their lives. But that is because they are going through a difficult phase of karma. But when we start defining ourselves or equating ourselves with the results that we get, then the results are problematic. And one reason why people suffer so much from depression or anxiety or mental health problems is that they are unable to accept the reality that sometimes they will go through dark times. So when one thing doesn't work, second thing doesn't work, third thing doesn't work, Instead of thinking, taking it too personally. Now, there could be some things wrong with us which we need to fix. But it's not that we are ourselves hopelessly wrong. Or hopeless, we are hopeless. But when we wed our self-worth to externals too much, then when the external results don't come, we become extremely disheartened by that. To the point that we might even lose our sanity or end our lives. When I was in college, one of my friends, he had this past college, so there's one friend who had also become a devotee. And he had another friend who was on the fringe. Sometimes you come to the temple, sometimes not come to the temple. And both of them, both of them passed out from the college. Actually, I was in America and I used, when I passed out from my college, Pass out me to fall on conscious over here. <laughs> so, so when I graduated, graduated, so this this devotee's friend, he got a job immediately. And all of this devotee had done, had done quite well in the academy, so he didn't get a job. And for six, seven months, he was applying for multiple companies and he did not get any job. And then one day his friend came to the temple and he 
said, I'm going to start practicing bhakti very seriously. I said, what happened? He said that, you know, I was having this job and still I was in so much anxiety. He said, you didn't have any job and still you are so cheerful. You must be getting something, some strength from somewhere. <laughs> so, he could observe, he was, he was trying to get a job, but he was not like, oh, I don't have a job at the end of my life, at the end of the world. He was reasonably balanced. So, in the material world also, see, although companies at a official level might be very harsh in terms of layoffs and things like that, but at an individual level, everybody knows that everybody gets a bad thing sometimes, everybody gets a, they, some projects just don't work. So, what people see when they are assessing individuals, say at an organizational level, they might have certain policies which might just be uh, dictated by the state of the economy and other things. But at individual level, even when people are hiring or people are uh, deciding who will get what posts, what they see is the overall track record of a person, the resilience of a person. So, if a person has a adequate level of uh, detachment from the immediates, then that is what enables us to be resilient. If a person is too caught up in the immediate, then you can't be resilient. So, in that sense, if we can have, you can manifest that resilience while working. If difficulties come, we accept them and move on. That will attract people. And rather than thinking of a managerial a top to bottom kind of percolation, you can look at a grassroots percolation. By our example, others can become attracted. And then others get attracted, more and more people get attracted by that. Okay? Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, a very interesting lecture of yours, um, but I thought it was related to, um, importantly, at least, at least uh, related, your lecture was related, I thought, to concepts in at least two other religions. Um, important, oh, I'm Concepts in your lecture was very interesting, I thought, and related, I thought, to, two, to concepts in at least two other religions, I think of, but, one importantly, which is, I thought it was very key on with your lecture, was um, related to in Western religion, which is um, it's often mistranslated. But the, the what it should be is that money is the the desire for money is the root of all evil, and so they usually translate as money is the root of all evil, but that's a mistranslation. It's really the desire for money is the root of all evil, and I think you're concept, in, in at least related to the Western, which is a very different concept, but they're similar. Mm -hmm. And because they don't really have an evil, I don't think, in the East. And the, but in Eastern religion, also, it was what you were saying, is related to in Buddhism, the Buddhist Atisha says that um, the greatest effort is not attached to results. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Actually, yes, the desire for money is the root of all evil. Yeah, it's true. Actually, it's more than the desire for money, it's the desire only for money. <laughs> it is to not have money is a problem, but to have only money and nothing else is a bigger problem. <laughs> we have only money and we have alienated everyone and uh, everybody is suspicious of us and, you know, people are just waiting. Wherever there is a will, there are many willing relatives. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Shri. Prabhuji, you said uh, Krishna asked Arjuna not to fight. Um, and like small, this is a temporary goal in my mind. Uh, it's a milestone that Arjuna had to achieve. But he raised him to a level where he said it's to establish dharma uh, yeah. and to surrender uh, to him. So mm. that's a mission. And only once he raised Arjuna to that level, Arjuna was empowered to fight, uh, fight against his relatives. Uh, 
uh, even in our uh, devotional life, we have we have targets, our services, our chant, our rounds, and all. We sometimes are able to do that. We're not able to do that sometimes as well. But what keeps us going, and that's our mission, is to uh, is that Krishna is our end. That he he's, he's not any means to us. He is our end. We have to achieve him. Is there a way we can translate this in our work life? Because I feel. Okay, we should not attach ourselves to goals which can be temporary or ephemeral, but there has to be something we attach to, a mission, a lifelong project. Uh, but how do we have that in our work life? So how can we have a mission or a lifelong project in our work life? It's like we have Krishna as the ultimate goal in our devotional life. There is, <coughs> there is, there are in th thought, there is analysis and there is synthesis. Analysis is where we divide things into their components. Synthesis is where we bring things together. So at one level, the Bhagavad Gita begins with analysis, separating the body and the soul. This is, this is material, this is related to the body, this is spiritual, this is related to the soul. But eventually, the Bhagavad Gita brings about both as a synthesis that the body and the soul work together for elevation. And that's why we see this in 18.46 and 47 where Krishna says, Yatah pravrittir bhutanam yena sarvami dantatam svakarmanatam abhyarja siddhim mindati manava that svakarmanatam abhyarja by your work worship that Lord. So some people translate this as work is worship. That's an oversimplification. Because if work itself is worship, the donkey would be the greatest worshipper. <laughs> <laughs> so the work can be done in the mood of worship. So because what Krishna is specifically telling is by your work, worship. That means now Yataha the first two lines of this was Yata Pravatya Bhutana Yena Sarvanam Tata. That from whom everything is eliminated and by whom everything is pervaded. That means we don't see the material world simply as made of matter disconnected from God. That actually God is present from, as the source of the world and he is also present in the world pervading it all. So if we have been given some abilities, if we have some interests, we use them wholeheartedly in a mood of doing justice to the gift that God has given us. And if by that we achieve some success, we achieve some position, we achieve some prestige, some wealth, that can also be used in Krishna's service. Directly, indirectly, directly means we could make offerings to Krishna. Indirectly could be that if we have a particular respectable position in society, and then we are practicing Krishna Bhakti, that attracts people. So we don't have to separate the two. The idea is that whatever abilities we have, we don't see them simply as our abilities, but as Krishna's gifts. But say that to have ability is a gift. Then to know that we have the ability is a greater gift. Because some people have talent, they don't even know they have the talent. And then to know that our ability is a gift is the greatest gift. To have ability is a gift. To know that we have the ability is a greater gift. To know that our ability is a gift. It is given to me by God. That is a, the greatest gift. Because then we will use the gift, but we will become proud because of that. If something which has been given to me, let me use it well. Okay, I think I mentioned in an earlier class that what we are is Krishna's gift to us. What we become is our gift to Krishna. So what we are, we have certain abilities, certain talents, certain interests, that is Krishna has given it to us. And what we become using this is our gift to Krishna. So it's not that as devotees, we dismiss our profession simply as mundane. To grow is natural. Uh, in, it's a natural condition, natural feature of the living condition. All of us we are unicellular organisms at one time. Now we have grown into fully grown human beings, millions of cells in our body. 
It's because it's growth. So, <coughs> growth is natural. However, cancer is also growth. The problem is, cancer is disproportionate and destructive growth. Where a person just obsesses, where one organ or one set of cells grows so much that they destroy the balance of the body. And eventually, they destroy the body itself. So, similarly, for us in our lives, we grow in all aspects of our life. But if one aspect becomes, we become so obsessive with that, that it erodes all other aspects, then that is not healthy. So in that to work, and work wholeheartedly, that is being responsible. But to become a workaholic, where someone is so obsessed with work, they just, they just have no sense of, what to speak of time for God, they don't even have time for their family, they don't have time for health, basic health, they just work, 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 work. That kind of obsessiveness, it might lead to some extraordinary seeming success, but that's like a shooting star. They go higher and then they come crashing down. If to be sustainable, growth has to be proportionate. So it's not that as devotees we don't seek, it's not that we don't have ambitions. But the ambition should not be at the cost of our devotion. We have time for our devotional activities, that time we do it wholeheartedly. And when you're doing our work, we do it wholeheartedly. So, having a sense of purpose in our professional life, yes, we definitely should have it, seeing that this is also my service to Krishna. And through this, so maybe for the people with whom I'm working in my office, now maybe the only contact with Krishna is me. And I have to be, I don't necessarily have to excel in the terms which they necessarily said. But broadly speaking, if they can see that, okay, this person is a nice person. Nice means they're dedicated to their work. How, how much excel, how much a person will excel, that will depend on a large variety of factors, including innate talent and a lot of things. But if people see that this person is responsible, this person is dedicated, this person is a gentle, this is a courteous person. They see that, that is what will attract them to Krishna. I was at a, at a university in India and a student asked me, that, how can I make my friends into devotees? I told him, we can't make anyone into devotee. They have to choose to become. But what we can do is, I said, you should try to study as diligently as possible. He says, if you study well, there is no guarantee that your friends will become devotees. But if you don't study well, there's guarantee nobody will become a devotee. <laughs> because becoming spiritual responsible is not becoming materially irresponsible. It is about taking a higher responsibility, not about giving up a lower responsibility. There is a dharma, there is a para dharma, and there is para dharma. A dharma is where a person is completely irresponsible, doesn't care for anything at all. Just lives animalistically. Aparadharma is material religion. Where people are responsible, okay, I will take care of my family, I will take care of my children. All that is important. But with all due respects, even animals do that. Now, when a kitten is small, a cat is very, very protective of the kitten. We just zealously taking care of our children, that doesn't make us spiritual. So it is when we care for the soul, and try to elevate that soul. That's when it, it makes it spiritual. So that is, so up, there's aparadharma is material religion. Paradharma is spiritual religion. So we, when we take up paradharma, only in the special emergency situations, when the paradharma and aparadharma are in direct conflict, that is the exceptional situation when we may have to choose paradharma instead of aparadharma. But for most times, both work together. That's why we, if we see that this is also my service to Krishna. And through this, I can reach to a particular set of people who will never be reached to otherwise, or most likely. Then, through our work also, we can see that as a service to Krishna. Maybe not directly, but indirectly. And maybe to people who would, be, who would never be reached by direct. They're just not directly interested in Krishna consciousness. That way also we can see his virtue. Okay? Thank you. 
So let's move on to the next section. No? So now, actually, not the next section, the same section is going on. Now, Krishna says over here that such work, samatvam, equanimity. If you're equipoise like this, samatvam, yoga, chate. You're not too attached to success or failure, but you can work in an equipoised way, that is yoga uchyate. And now Krishna says, this kind of work is far better than working with attachment to results. Why? Because if you work with attachment to results, your consciousness stays small. Say like, what do I mean by consciousness? Let's recite these words. What do I mean first? Durena yavaram karma buddhi yoga dhananjaya Uddhav Sharana Manvicha Krupana Palahetava. So Krishna is saying over here that those who work only for the results are small minded. So you can get an example for this. Say some students study uh, only for getting marks. Now most students study like that. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> whatever way it is. But suppose somebody studies only for getting marks and then later on says uh, they have that becomes the major subject for their study say somebody has studied throughout school or college they studied physics just because they had to get some marks and now they are doing a phd in physics <laughs> then all that just studying for getting marks they will not have developed an educated mind they have not get developed a deep understanding of the subject and then they will have to study it all again to get the basics right so that they can go deep into the subject so you could study either to just get marks or we could study to get an understanding of the subject or at a deeper level we could study to get an educated mind. A mind, not just a mind that is learned but a mind that is capable of learning. Generally those who are disciplined in their work ethos, they are disciplined if they work in one field they are good. They're good. They work in another field also, they are good. They might excel in a field for which they have innate talent or attraction, but their discipline ensures that they do well in whatever field they go. So, what, so you could work, if somebody works only for getting marks, they will get the marks, but they will not get the knowledge. Their, their brain will also not get trained to study diligently and learn well. So a small result of studying is getting marks. A big result is gaining a mind a learned mind capable of learning. So similarly Krishna says, eh, those who work for immediate results, that is avaram karma, that is inauspicious work, it will not lead to any great result. But, buddha sharana manvicha, with your intelligence recognize that you are meant for something bigger in your life and therefore renounce the results of your work and by that you will get eternal result. That eternal result Krishna talks about in the next series of verses from 50 to 53. His whole theme is that you can attain eternal results. So at this point, Arjun is thinking, okay, the kind of person Krishna is talking about, one who is detached from the fruits of the work, will this person fight a war or will not fight a war? Because that's Arjuna's question also. Should I fight or should I not fight? So he asks a question. Hey, what are the characteristics of such a person? Can you go to 50, 53rd verse? 53rd? Actually, 54th rather. 54th, yeah. Let's recite this now. Arjuna Vacha Sita Arya Sita Bhasha Samadhi Satsikesha Sita Jiki Prakashayana Kima Sita Prajeta Kim. So, Sita Pragya Sika Bhasha. What? is the language of such a person. Samadhi Sasyakesha, one who Krishna has talked earlier with the previous word Samadhi, one who stayed, who is situated in the spiritual equanimity, spiritual trance. And Siddhadhi Kim Prabha Sheta, how does such a person speak? Kim Asita Prajeta Kim, how does such a person sit? And how does such a person walk? The Bhagavad Gita is, a, it's a Gita, Gita means it's poetry. And poetry is characterized by figures of speech. If you take this book, take this verse literally, how does such a person sit? How does such a person walk? Is, is, Krishna, is Arjun asking about a fashion ramp model? You know, what is the way that person walks? What is the way a person sits? No. 
it's, it's clear, clearly what Arjuna is asking is not literal. So he's ka bhasha. Bhasha at one level means language. But language is largely a tool for describing. And we describe things that we observe, the people we have met, experiences that we have had, thoughts that we have. So here bhasha means not the tool with which you describe, but what is described. So how is such a person described? What are the characteristics of such a person? And then kim prabhavashita. It might seem repetitive. What, is, what are the characteristics of such a person? But, and how does a person behave? Or rather, how does a person speak? That means, how does such a person respond to life's ups and downs? Does a person get angry, wild, dejected? A person's speech often reveals uh, reveals uh, their inner their inner uh, level of intelligence, their inner level of consciousness. Sometimes it is it is better to be stay if we don't know anything about a subject and we stay silent. If we, people think I'm a fool, so it is better to stay silent and be thought of as a fool than to speak and remove all doubts about the subject. <laughs> If we don't know, we just say that. So, kim prabhashita. So that means, how does a person respond to life's ups and downs? So what is the nature of their speech? And asita and rajet is used here in the sense of how does a person restrain the senses? So you sit and to walk. Now when we sit, our karmendriya, say our feet, are inactive. When we walk, our feet are active. So what Krishna is saying is, how does such a person restrain the senses? So Asit refers to restrain the senses. And Vrajit, how does a person walk? Is how does a person engage the senses? How does such a person act in the world? So there are four questions by which Arjun wants to know what are the characteristics of such a person? Ka bhasha. Now, Krishna answers first and foremost, by talking about how such a person is internally driven. We go to the next verse, 55th verse. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Prajapati Yada Kama Sarvam Atmano Gatan Atma Yadavana Dusha Siddha Pratyasta Dochate. So there are many desires that will keep popping into our mind. Just eat this, watch this, touch this, go here, go there. A person is detached from those external desires. And Atmanya Eva Atmana Antushta. That doesn't mean that the person doesn't care for pleasure, but rather that person finds happiness within. That is the characteristic of a Siddha Pragya, of a person who is enlightened, a person who is spiritually situated. And then, so there are four questions over there. So the first question is answered in this verse. Then the next question, how does the person speak? The defining characteristics, Prabhupada says, a spiritualist is one who seeks pleasure internally. A materialist is one who speaks pleasure externally. Now we may say, but we come to a temple. Isn't that we are going externally somewhere to seek pleasure? Isn't it? But yes, we are coming to a temple, but what are we doing in a temple? In a temple, we are connecting more with the Lord who is inside us. So certain externals are supportive for the internal journey. And we definitely need those externals. But we are not seeking external pleasures. We are going to those external pleasures where the internal pleasure becomes more easily accessible. Uh, so this is the answer. First characteristic is that the person seeks inner pleasure, not external, outer pleasure. Then the next answer is this person is equipoised amidst happiness and distress. Can you go ahead? Next verse. We'll go down. Yeah. Uh, next, actually next verse, 56 and 57 talk about the same thing, but I'll go to 57, 57, yes, inside this. Yaha sarvatta naam islehas tattat kapya shubha shubham naam inandati nana kleshti tasya pranyama deshchita na abhinandati nadveshti That the person doesn't delight uh, that, oh, I got such a wonderful thing in my life, nadveshti, why has such a terrible thing happened in my life? But tasya pragyam pratishtha. The person stays equal. Why? Because the person understands what I am getting is not necessarily determined only by 
what I have done right now. The same principle of Karmandi Vadikaras. And the simple example to illustrate this is, let's suppose say we are near our house and there is some supermarket and we have a monthly credit arrangement with them. So we buy throughout the month and on the last day of the month they give us the bill. On the last day of the month say three friends go there and they all buy some two dollar worth of some small toffees or some cookies or whatever. And they're coming out. When they come out, the first person gets a two dollar bill, the second person gets a two hundred dollar bill, and the third person gets a two thousand dollar bill. Hey, what is this? This is discrimination. <laughs> but is it discrimination? No. If somebody got a two thousand dollar bill, that's because that throughout the month they have bought so many other things. And right now, the bill that they are getting is not just for what they have bought. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. There is a correspondence, but not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So somebody might say that if somebody has already got some credit saved with the, with the, with the shop, and they buy a $200 worth thing, and they get just a $2 bill. Hey, I got this for cheap. Well, it's not exactly cheap. So, na dveshti na binandati. That what we get right now, it's not necessarily a judgment on how we have performed. There's no need to resent or no need to delight. Just stay focused on doing your duty. But this, not getting too affected by life's joys or sorrows. This is a characteristic of a person who is spiritually purposeful. It's not that they're unemotional. Naturally, be emotional with there. If something good comes in their life, they'll be happy. But they don't get carried away by the happiness. Nor do they get they get swept away by distress. They stay focused. If happiness comes, good. Distress comes, that's also okay. Let's move on in my life. So this is a characteristic. And in terms of speaking, they don't get they praise or resent things too much. Then from 58 to 63, Krishna talks about Kim Asita. How does a person control the senses? So let's go to, uh, let's go back a little bit. You can go to 60. 60 is, let's recite this verse. Yatato yabhi kaunteya purushasya vipashchita indriyani pramadhini haranti prasabham mana So it says, uh, Krishna says here, that if in those who try very much to control their senses, to control their desires and they are also intelligent. Yet the to is they are endeavoring. And vipashchitaha, they are also discerning. They understand this is good, this is not good. But still, the senses are so wide, indriyani pramatini, haranti prasabhamana. It drags away the mind. So here it is important to understand that how, how does uh, sense control or lack of sense control work? So now, first of all, why do we need to control our senses? Because if we don't, they will control us. And if they control us, there is no limit. See, for lust, for anger, for greed, nothing is sacred. Nothing is sacred. Once we let ourselves be dragged, there is no limit to how much they will drag us down. And therefore, controlling them is important. Somebody is saying, okay, it's like, so nowadays people think you drink but don't get drunk. <laughs> it's a common philosophy. Yes, it's a, it's like saying, go to the edge of the cliff, look down, but don't fall down. <laughs> well, why go so close? Yes. There may be many people who drink and don't get drunk. It's possible. But once they have got the habit of drinking, if some difficulty comes in their life, that difficulty will be the time when they lose their balance. That's the time when they get drunk. So Krishna, so it's people have this idea that that if you have to control your senses, that it's don't overdo it. Just have a sense of that is as a drink, but don't get drunk. Now this is this is not recognized that one drink leads to another drink. You know, it's said about drinking. First the drinker takes the drink, then the drink takes the drink, <laughs> and then the drink takes the drinker. <laughs> it just keeps growing, 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 growing. And therefore it's 
best not to get involved. But still, the point is, if we are saying, I won't, I will not do something, it can seem like repression. It can seem like, how long can I repress this? I can't, I can't go on repressing this. And sometimes I just, just give up. So, a desire comes up within us, and I have to do this, I have to eat this, I have to watch this, I have to drink this, I have to buy this. So, the desire seems to keep going, growing, 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 growing. And as the desire starts growing, we start feeling, how long can I resist it? So, what happens after some time we think that, anyway, if I never resist it today, tomorrow I'll give, tomorrow I have to give it. So, better give, let me give up today only. And then we give up. So, what, what, when we have this vision, what is happening is we think of the desire to be like, or an urge, you could say over here, the urge to be like a linearly rising line. It is here now. If I don't say this, it will keep growing, 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 growing. And eventually it will become so much that I'll have to give in. So better let me give in now. But our desires or our urges are not like endlessly rising lines. They are like endlessly recurring waves. The waves will keep coming. But it is not that the wave keeps going, 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 going all the way forever up. The wave hits a crest and then it falls. So I, I just came from Hawaii. So I was giving this in, uh, example in a class. And this one devotee said that that is actually surfing. <laughs> Surf <laughs> surfing means what? You don't get swept away by the wave, but you go with the wave. So if you catch the wave, you will go up with the wave, you will come down with the wave. But you won't get swept away by the wave. So for us, we need to understand this point that if we have this vision that this desire, this urge is going to grow, 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 grow and how long can I fight? And then we will give. But if we understand that the urge is not going to grow infinitely. It grows, 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 grows. It grows up to a particular point but after that it goes down. And then the intense struggle to resist it that is there right now, it won't be there. Next time also the urge will come. But it won't start from here. It will again start as a wave from below. Again it will rise. So it's like endlessly recurring waves. So if we have the proper vision of the urge, we won't think if I have to resist it, that means I have to I have to be tortured for the rest of my life with this insatiated desire, unsatisfied, dissatisfied desire, unsatisfied desire. No, the desire comes, stays for some time, goes. Again it comes, stays for some time, goes. So another example to understand this is like a say an arm wrestling match. Two people are <coughs> and say the other person seems to be very strong and they're pulled down, down, struggling and it's almost touched the ground. And you may think, okay, this person is so strong, it's paining so much, how long can I hold this attack? And you think like that and just give up. But imagine if this arm wrestling match is like a time, uh, arm wrestling match with timed rounds. Say for both of them, they have a three minute round. And in three minute, if you don't push the other person down, then that round is over. And if you get, our, our arm might be right next to the ground, next to the ground, or the table's floor, or table. But if we can survive those three minutes, if we survive the present round, we will be resume on neutral ground. Hmm? We would again begin over here. Next round will begin over here again. So, our urges, they are like battling with the urges, like playing a timed arm wrestling match. That's why we shouldn't think that if I have to take all this up, it's for the rest of my life I will be tormented. No. If, as soon as we think for the rest of my life, then the mind will say, okay, you do it in the rest of your life. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> Not now. Now you indulge. So, for this, what we need is tolerance, patience. Yes. Although it feels unbearable, it's not going to feel like this for all time. And this becomes easier. The next verse Krishna will say beside this verse. Tani sarvani samyamya yukta asita matpara vashediya sedriyani tasya pradya pradeshita So Krishna says, how will it become easier? Tani, you restrain the senses as much as you can. But don't focus on restraining the senses. 
focus on connecting with me. Yukta asi tamatparaha. Fix your consciousness on me. So when we are trying to resist an urge, if you keep thinking, I will not do this, I will not do this, I will not do this, I will not do this. We are thinking, I will not do this, I will not do this, I will not do this. The mind quietly creeps into the eraser and erases the knot. <laughs> I will not do this, I will not do this, I will do this, I do this. <laughs> so we can't focus on what we will not do. Instead, we have to focus on what we will do. So bhakti is not so much about saying no to temptation as saying yes to Krishna. Bhakti is about filling our consciousness with Krishna. And that's why in our devotional service, we need to always focus more on what we take up for Krishna rather than what we give up, what we have to give up. So if you find out, okay, I, I like to hear classes, I like to do kirtans, I like to do the worship of the deities, I like to do the seva. Then do that more and more. Think of bhakti primarily in the terms of what we can fill our life with. And when we fill our life with the positive, the negative will gradually go out. Negative will gradually go out. Desires cannot be driven out of our consciousness, but they can be crowded out. If our consciousness becomes filled with Krishna, then the urges get crowded out. That's why he says, Yukta Asi Tamatparaha. Fix your consciousness on me. But if you don't do this, instead of fixing the consciousness on Krishna, if you fix on something else, that's what I talk in the next verse. Dhyayato Vishayana We contemplate the sense objects. What happens is, whatever, this is, a, this is a universal psychological principle, whatever gets our attention, gets us. Whatever gets our attention, gets us. And almost all advertising is based on this principle. All advertising is just trying to get our attention some way or the other. Just get, get us. They get our attention, then they get us. So if we give our attention to Krishna, then temptation can't get us. They are here. So here we focus on trying to directing our thought energy towards Krishna. But if it goes towards temptation, then it drags us down. So this is uh, 63rd, the 63rd verse Krishna is saying, how do you regulate your senses? By fixing the consciousness on me. And then how do you engage the senses? That is as directed by scripture. You go ahead. Ragadvesha vimuktaistu vishaya indriyascha Atma so, Ragadvesha Vimukta is true. That we all have certain things which we like and certain things we don't like. But instead of being, here, here Krishna says Raga and Vesha, it's more in terms of fleeting feelings that come up. I just don't like to do this. I like to do this. Krishna says, put aside your likes and dislikes and do what is important. So, sometimes when we Say we, we wake up in the morning, I don't feel like waking up. If you have had adequate rest, then we still wake up. If sometimes we do that, after we wake up, then we start feeling fresh after that. But if we don't wake up and stay asleep, then as we stay in illusion. So, our immediate feelings are not always reliable guides to what is beneficial for us or even what we really want to do. Our feelings will keep coming and going. So Krishna says, don't let your life be guided by your feelings. Let your life be guided by scripture. Atma vashayir vidhaya atma. Vidhaya atma is scripture. So if our life is guided by scripture, then what will happen? We will be on the right path. Letting our life be guided by feelings is like if we are in the ocean, we see waves coming. Oh, here the stormy wave, let me go there. Then I go there, stormy waves come there, let me go there. Let me go there. We are just trying to avoid a storm in the ocean. Stormy, we will stay lost in the ocean. But if you take, focus on taking the part to the land, you will eventually get to land. Prasada madhi gachiti. Prasada is the mercy of the Lord. And then he says, by this prasada, by this mercy, we will become gain purity. We will get liberated from illusion. We will attain transcendence. Then Krishna says, can you go to 69th verse straight? Yanisha sarva bhuta together. So this is also a curious verse. 
that which is night for all living beings is day for the self-realized. And that which is night for the self-realized is day for all living beings. Now what is Krishna talking about here? He could be talking about you know, people in India and people in America. <laughs> Where it is day in India, it is night in America. <laughs> Where it is night in America, it is day in India. Hmm? He is not talking about geography, he is talking about consciousness. So day, if we take it literally, well day is whether you are self-realized or you are uh, not self-realized. If we consider day in terms of when the sun rises, it is the same for everyone. So again, the Bhagavad Gita has its poetry, its non-literal usage over here. So day indicates the time of clarity and activity. A day is the time when we can see things clearly and we act clearly. And night is the time of unclarity and inactivity. So for the spiritual people, it is the spiritual activities that are the arena of clarity and activity. This is what is important in life. This is what we should be doing in our lives. And for the materialistic people, what is the spiritual business? What do you do? For so many hours, you chant, you study, you go to the temple. What do you do actually? I just can't make sense of things. Because for them, it's all oh, you go to the temple, you go to the temple, you go to spiritual. What do you do over there? But for a spiritualist, so you go to parties, you go to what do you do over there? <laughs> you know, one thinker he said, What is news? News is the same old things happening to new people. <laughs> okay, this team lost, this team won. Well, that's always been happening. These new people are involved, that's all. So from a spiritual perspective, Atah Kavibin Namasuya Vadanta. It's just a play of words, there's nothing more than that. So here Krishna is telling that we have to stand apart from the world. If you want to be spiritual, we cannot expect the world's approval. The world is moving in a different way, we are moving in a different way. It's not that we have to actively court the world's disapproval. <coughs> it's not that we have to anger or alienate or dispute the people, but we recognize that we are choosing a different path. And if we are ready to do that, then we can move forward. And then in the next verse, it's another beautiful metaphor. Let's recite this. So here the very interesting word is that Kama Kami. Kama is desire. And Kami is the possessor of desire or desirer. So, na kama kami means do not be the desirer of desire. Now, what does it mean? Do not be the desirer of desire. That means Krishna is telling over here that desires will, desires will pop up. Either from the outer world, the advertisements or the inner world through our mind's impressions. Come on, eat this, watch this, touch this, buy this. These desires will pop up. But do not be a desirer of desire. The desires will pop up, but don't get carried away by them. Since temptations will come, we don't have to welcome. <laughs> temptations will come, but we don't have to welcome them. Yes, come, I'll do it. No. I understand these are just simply coming by the world's impression, by the impression that are there in the either in the culture outside or in the mind inside. They'll come, but I don't have to say yes to them. And how can we say no to them? He gives the example of ocean. It's interesting, normally we think of desires as flowing out from us. Say we, we go to a shopping mall and we see something, I want to buy this. So like people are alcoholics, there are people also who are shopaholics. <laughs> shopaholics, you know, shop, 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 shop till you drop. <laughs> Just keep shopping around. So whatever you see, you want to shop. Now what happens over there is, no, so normally we think of desire as something which flows out from us. I am here, the object is there, and I desire the object. But Krishna is talking about desire as something flowing into us. A river flows into the ocean. And that ocean is our consciousness. Now imagine if, uh, if there is a puddle and the river flows into it. 
then the puddle will completely get overflown and the puddle and everything around it will get disrupted. But if instead of a puddle, there is an ocean over there. Then even if the river flows into the ocean, the, the ocean will not get disrupted. So similarly, Krishna is telling over here, make your consciousness into an ocean. Don't let your consciousness be like a puddle. Now what determines whether our consciousness will be like a puddle or will be like an ocean? That is determined by what is present in our consciousness. If small, small objects are present in our consciousness, then our consciousness is like a puddle. If our consciousness is caught with what is the latest cricket score, which team won, then if our favorite team loses, it will be like the end of the world for us. It's not, it's not, there's no laughing matter. There are, there are sports fans, last time in Sri Lanka, last the World Cup final, there are several sports fans in Sri Lanka committed suicide. The players didn't commit suicide, but the fans committed suicide. So for the players, they just went on with life. It was, of course, they felt bad, but they went on. So what happens is, it depends on the magnitude of the attachment. So if the consciousness is like a puddle, then, oh, my favorite team lost the match. It's like a river coming into it, the puddle gets disrupted completely. So, if we are attached to small things, then our consciousness becomes small like a puddle. But if we become attached to big things, then our consciousness becomes like a ocean. And bhakti is the process of making our consciousness attached to the biggest thing, to Krishna. So when we practice bhakti, and our consciousness becomes attached to Krishna, then we understand that, yes, this problem might come, this desirable object might come in, but these are all like rivers. I have the ocean with me. Krishna is supreme. He is supremely attractive. He is supremely satisfying. If other things come to me of their own accord, I'll accept them. If they don't come to me, I'll still keep moving toward Krishna. So bhakti is about getting Krishna to manifest in our consciousness. And the more Krishna manifests in our consciousness, the more our consciousness becomes oceanic. And as it becomes like an ocean, the world's ups and downs will not disturb us that much. And then the last verse Krishna will tell, let's go to 2.72. Esha Brahmi Siti Partha Naina Prabhya Muriyati Sita Syamanta Kaleti Brahma Nirvana Vrikshati if you can be situated in this consciousness, the oceanic consciousness, then Brahmi is this is, a this is a state of spiritual consciousness. And somebody can be like this at the time of death. Nainam prapya vimuhiya. This person will not be deluded. And somebody can be situated like this at the time of death. Sitva asyam antakale pi. Then Brahma nirvana richati. Such a person will attain the spiritual destination. The person will attain life supreme perfection. So here Krishna is telling, Arjuna's question was, how can, what are the characteristics of a self-realized person? And Krishna's answer tells that he takes it all the way, describing not just the characteristics, but describing the process by which we can develop the characteristics, and describing the result of living in this way. So Krishna tells Arjuna that if you live in this way, if you are in this consciousness, you know, whether you die in this battlefield here, that you will in this battlefield live a long life and then you die later. You will still attain eternal perfection. And that is the ultimate objective for all of us. Everything that we gain in the world, it will it'll stay with us till the end of our life. If we are fortunate. You know, it may be lost even before that also. But even if it stays till the end of our life, what will go with us beyond that is our consciousness. And if in our consciousness is Krishna, then at the time of death, when we die, when people leave home, the, the body, if, it's, if the person is dying at home, then the body leaves home and goes to the, goes to the crematorium. But for, a, for one who is devoted to Krishna, at the time of death, we don't leave home, but we go home. We don't leave home, but we go home. If Krishna has become our object of attachment, we understand where Krishna is, that is our eternal home. 
And yes, the home here matters, but it matters because this is also a place where we are serving Krishna. And our home in this world, it shouldn't become our ultimate object of attachment. The home in this world is a place of shelter, it is a place of comfort, it is a place of affection. And if it is all centered on Krishna, then through all that shelter, comfort, affection, our attachment to Krishna increases. And then, at the time of death, we go home to be united with Krishna for a life of eternal love and eternal joy. And by the time of death, if our attachment to our Lord has become greater than our attachment to this world, then the Lord will take us out of this world to his eternal abode. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the second part from text 38 to 38 to 72. So in this section, I primarily focused on three main themes. The first part was about working with detachment and how Krishna has earlier, Arjuna had the idea of karma kanda, that dharma artha kama. So by doing religious activities, we can get possession, good possessions and good relations. And that's how we can be happy. Krishna is giving another higher level. That, okay, by that, you will maybe be happy in this mortal world of the Martya Loka, or you might go to the Amar Loka, the heavens. But beyond the Martya, Amar and Chiranjiva is the Nitya. And that is what is to be attained. And for that, to attain that, Krishna says, focus not on the immediate result, focus on the ultimate result. So, Karman Nevadika Rastevas is not about not caring about the result. It is about caring for something bigger than the immediate result. Uh, we understand that there's there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the work that we do and the result that we get. It is a, a, a certain combination of our present work, a certain combination of our past work, all combined together and gives the present result. So rather than we can set goals so that we do our best, but after we've done our best, we don't obsess over the results, knowing that they are, they are not in our control. This way, we can stay purposeful without getting swept up and down by the waves of duality in life. And like a student who is, works only for marks, doesn't learn the subject well and doesn't get an educated mind. That's small mindedness. But a student who, similarly, if a person works only for immediate results, then their consciousness is not evolved. They do not understand the nature of reality. And they don't grow ultimately. In the second section, we talk about sense control. And Krishna over there says that the spiritually minded person they don't seek pleasure externally, but internally. And with respect to external temptations, they restrain them. And in that connection, we talked about how resisting our urges is, is like fighting a timed arm wrestling match. Our urges are not like endlessly rising lines, they are like endlessly recurring waves. So if you can just survive the present round, we will resume our neutral ground. And for doing that, we need to Focus not on what we are giving up, but on what we are taking up. We connect with Krishna and fix our consciousness with Krishna, then resisting our urges becomes easier. And the last part he talked about was making our consciousness oceaniac. That to stand apart from the world, from the world desires will keep coming, temptations may come, we don't have to welcome. Do not be a desirer of desire, Krishna says. And how do we do that? If our consciousness make a puddle, then the river of desires will come and disrupt. But if we become attached to Krishna, bring Krishna into our consciousness, consciousness becomes oceanic, then the river of desires won't disrupt us. And if we can have that consciousness at the time of death, then at death we don't leave home, but we go home. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.
I give the same class elsewhere, nobody applauds like this. <laughs> so, Ma Fale Shukadachana. So, my class is not the cause of the result. <laughs> the, result is, the result is because of all of your appreciative heart. So, thank you for your devoted heart, Hare Krishna. Did you prepare for this class well? Or? <laughs> I don't so much prepare for my classes as I prepare to understand the philosophy. Because I'm writing quite a bit, so I'm thinking about the philosophy quite a bit and I'm writing really on the Bhagavad Gita. So it's, I don't specifically prepare point by point for the classes, but I do prepare the subject thoroughly. And then there is a certain amount of the background preparation plus a certain amount of spontaneity in exactly which points I speak in which class. Okay. One question anyone has? Okay. Yes, please. Thank you, Shambhu. Thank you for the wonderful class. So, one of the verses where Krishna is comparing the uh, well as well as the flood, which is often uh, interpreted as that the well is compared to the Vedas themselves, and the uh, the flood is compared to the realization themselves. So, one should reject the Vedas, and then one should just focus on the realization. So, what is your comment on that? Okay. I, what I deliberately avoided, you have specifically asked. <laughs> because it was a little technical subject, I didn't want to get into it, but I'll try to answer briefly. So, <clears throat> in the metaphor, Yavana, in the verse 2.46, Yavana Thaudapani Sarvataha Sampyodhavake Tavan Sarveshu Vedeshu Brahmana Sirjanataha. It is said that uh, more important than knowing the Vedas is the person who has realized the purpose of the Vedas. So the Vedas are compared to a well and the knowing the purpose of the Vedas is considered to be like the river or the flood everywhere. So what does this actually mean? Is it that we have to give up the Vedas? The Vedas are a broad body of knowledge which are called a Kalpataru. Kalpataru is a desire tree. So now Suppose that we go to a supermarket and if some product is in heavy demand, then it's also likely that it's available abundantly at the top office, at that supermarket. Because they know many people are going to ask for it, but they keep it in the abundant supply. But if we want a particular product which is very rarely bought, then they may have it in very meager supply or they basically have to order it. So, the supermarket's stock reflects the demand of the local market. Isn't it? So, similarly, the Vedas are a Kalpataru and they, they provide means for people to fulfill their desires. So, if somebody is not getting a child and they want a child, okay, then do this Putra Kamishti Yagya, by which you can get the child. Somebody, there's no rains over there, okay, then use, it, use the Pajanya Yagya. By this you can get rains. So dif there are different practices described by which different desires can be fulfilled. Now, just as the supermarket will primarily have those things which most people want. Similarly, the Vedas primarily contain discussion about those subjects which most people are interested in. And most people are interested in material this world gives. Very few people think about something beyond the world. So because most people are, interest, are, are materialistic, not, it's good that they are religiously materialistic, not irreligiously materialistic, but still they are materialistic. So therefore most of the Vedas talks about material religiosity. And it is this material religiosity that the Bhagavad Gita is taking Arjun beyond. And that's why this is 2.46, 2.45, the verse before that was Traigunya Vishaya Veda Mistraigunya Bhava Arjuna. So, 
the Vedas talk about the subtitles within material nature, go beyond that. Now the way, just as a supermarket might contain also some products which are rarely to be purchased. They will be available, but they will be available in small quantity. So like that Krishna and devotion to Krishna is talked about, but not much. However, the whole purpose of the Vedas is ultimately to point toward Krishna. The idea is that, okay, you want this, 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 all this will get, you, it'll, it'll work. You can get this desire fulfilled. See, a very important realization for every one of us on our spiritual journey is that fulfilling our desires does not bring fulfillment. Normally we think, my desires are dissatisfied, so I am unhappy. Desire is fulfilled, then I become happy. It is true that when our desires are unfulfilled, there is unhappiness. But the opposite is not true. When our desires are fulfilled, that does not bring fulfillment. Unfortunately, when it doesn't bring fulfillment, what we do is, we think, maybe another desire if I fulfill that will be fulfilled. But, yes, it's another desire, it's not another category of desire. Not another material desire, but another spiritual desire. So, when people want their material desires to be fulfilled, and they get it fulfilled through the Vedas, but over a period of time, they realize this doesn't bring fulfillment. Then they will look for something higher. And in the Vedas are there to give Krishna, to give Krishna Bhakti, to give transcendence. But this, rising from seeking another material desire to another kind of desire, a spiritual desire, that may require lifetimes of evolution. Bhagavan Janma Namante Gyanavan Maam Prapatita 7.19 Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. So it might take lifetimes. Of course, if somebody associates with a devotee who gives them understanding and inspiration, it can happen in a few, much shorter time also. But the Bhagavad Gita is guiding Arjun from the material religiosity to spiritual. So in that sense, when he's saying reject the Vedas, it's not the Rajiv Devidas in the totality. When you go to the supermarket, say, if you go to a big bookshop, uh, most of the popular books might be some uh, pulp, 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 pulp fiction, some romantic fiction, this. But the real classy books might be in some other place where not many people read those books. So, this Trigun Yoga, Krishna says, reject the Vedas, means reject all the glamorized section of the Vedas. Go to the transcendental spiritual section. And Veda is to survive, the ultimate purpose of all the Vedas is to point us toward Krishna. So when he's saying that go, don't give up the river and go towards the ocean, that doesn't literally mean reject the Vedas. It means reject the material section of the Vedas and focus on the transcendental purpose of the Vedas. And that is what has been done in the Srimad Bhagavatam, where the directly the glorification of Krishna is done. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Gaur Pramananda ki. Chaitanya